Usually what happens in a typical fMRI analysis is we use something called convolution. And our assumption is when we do some sort of cognitive process or we get some sort of stimulus, like an auditory stimulus or a visual stimulus, we see what's called a canonical hemodynamic response function. We make an assumption that this response in blood flow and oxygenation and corresponding increase or decrease of fMRI signal follows a pretty similar pattern. Now this isn't always a great assumption seeing as how vascularization can be different in different parts of the brain. There can just be different types of physiological interactions going on in the brain and we usually don't see something that clean and that clear everywhere. Nevertheless, it's a pretty powerful technique because it's a very simple assumption. You don't need to estimate many parameters and in most cases, all, the only parameter that you're estimating is the height of the bold response, either how positive does it go or how negative does it go. Now, if you want to do something a little bit more complex and get a more nuanced view of the actual uh, hemodynamic response going on, you can use a convolution-free model. Usually this is called a, a finite impulse response or FIR model or a stick function. You see it referred to by a bunch of different names. In AFNI it goes by uh, what's called a tent function. Okay, that's there are a couple variations on that, but tent function is what's most commonly used. What we're going to do is after each event of interest, we are simply going to estimate the uh, amount of signal change at each time point after that event. Now we get to specify how many time points and over how wide of a window we want to look at each of these uh, little knots. Okay, so. I'm going to do a very brief example using the AFNI uh, dataset 6. As you can see right here, AFNI data 6, the one that's available online. Now, this is a block design, and you usually don't use finite impulse response models with uh, block designs. I mean, you can, but usually you know, it's assumed that you're going to get a pretty uh, high activation. It's going to stay up at a plateau for a while and then go back down. But you, you can still use it here. I'm just going to show you. Uh, how to do it. So here's the, the deconvolve script I'm going to be using here. Notice it's very similar to what's come with that data set that's already online. All I've done is I've changed the basis function we're using from the gamma, that can, uh, canonical hemodynamic response function, replacing it with this tent. Okay, it requires three arguments, three things to put in here. One is where do you want to start this time window, where do you want to end it, and how many knots or how many time points do you want to estimate. Right? Likewise here. So at every time point in these files it says that, you know, this we're giving a visual stimulus or an auditory stimulus, and now within this window from 0 to 20 seconds afterwards, estimate 11 time points. Okay? And I've made much of the rest the same. I'm just outputting everything into this C bucket so all the, the coefficient statistics into a separate data file. So let's go ahead and run this. It might take just a little bit. Well, it's going, I'm going to talk some more. Okay, so what we can do now is instead of just saying, okay, I know I can do some contrast of whether this condition is greater than or less than this condition in terms of activity, now we can say, well, at what time points specifically after this this stimulus was turned on or this cognitive process elicited are there differences in specific time points because we might be losing some information by just estimating one big increase or decrease in the amount of activity we can say maybe there's a difference at a later point in the time window of this hemodynamic response or maybe earlier on and that might also be of interest Obviously, this is constrained somewhat by your sampling rate. If your TR is very, very slow, in the, like three seconds, you're not going to get as much information. If it's very high, like a second, second and a half, you get more temporal resolution. Okay, so notice everything has been written into this C bucket data sets, C stats. I'm going to extract certain things here. I'm just going to show you what's in there, first of all. Um, so these are all the coefficients for everything. So the polynomials. And notice here for the visual condition, I have 11 time points, just like I specified in my model. So at time point 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And these correspond to my TR or my sampling rate. So at 0 seconds, 2 seconds, 4 seconds, 6 seconds after that stimulus response. Okay? So you can use it to capture as wide of a window 
as you want. Obviously, the more time points you're trying to estimate, the less power you're going to have in your model. Okay, let's say I'm just interested in these visual time points right here. I just want to extract those. So I can use 3D Bucket to extract just these parts of that data set. Okay, so roughly 12 to 22. Okay, so let's do that right here. So 3D Bucket prefix, uh, vis coefficients, and that CSTATS data set. And this is the nomenclature for how you pull that stuff out. Okay, that's all been taken out. I'm going to boot up Apne here. And just for simplicity's sake, I already have this visual ROI that I've created. It's way back in the brain. I know it's here somewhere. Trust me. Well, we can you can lock onto it by using clusterize reports and then just jump to that location. Now, if I load up my auxiliary data set, remember I just created this data set called visual coefficients. I set that, and now when I plot this, it's going to extract from this little ROI right here. It could be any blob that you have from a statistics data set or ROI that you created. doesn't matter. Click on plot, and now I have plotted right here everything in those different time points. So there are 11 total going from 0 to 10. Okay, so if you include 0, that's 11. And at each one, it's giving you an estimate of how much activity there was Average across this ROI for that specific condition. So I hope that's pretty clear. I can save that out, and this is going to make this plus 01 mean. And notice here all the time, the, all the estimates for each time point in this graph right here. So you can load these into Excel. Uh, imagine you can do this across several subjects and then run appropriate statistics on that and make comparisons of different time points to other time points and see whether there are differences. So that's a, a really simple introduction to FRIR models, uh, how you set them up, how you run them, how you can extract the information from specific regions within the brain. It gives you some more interesting information. It can also drive you a little crazy because you can get really, really weird, messy shapes that are difficult to interpret. But we're academics. We don't want to make life easy.